So, you mentioned UCLA a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. I found out that you started off by majoring in sports medicine. I did. How did you go from sports medicine to acting? Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I, I left high school with a scholarship to go to UCLA to study sports medicine because you can't make a living as an actor. That's sports. a silly idea. I know. That's, who that's foolish. That? <laughs> well, I mean, I come, from a fam- I come from a family that has no frame of reference for this. Yeah. And, you know, the, my dad, uh, you know, worked his way up from assembly to, you know, supervisor in the electronic industry. And he's, he's a every... Friday or every two week paycheck kind of guy, mm-hmm. you know, you don't you don't step out like this and be freelance, <laughs> God forbid, you know. But so you know, I, I, I at that time in the late seventies, early eighties, sports medicine was a really hot upcoming field. Now it's hot and it's huge, but mm-hmm. at that time it was you know really a great place to go. So it was a smart decision. Um, but at my senior year, uh, on a whim, I auditioned for the senior class musical, which. My high school every year does a big musical at the end of the year for the senior with the senior class, sort of like the last thing they do together before they graduate. Mm-hmm. And my uh, year it was Fiddler on the Roof, and I figured, you know, if I'm going to fall flat on my face, I'm going to audition for the lead. I'm I'm going for it. You know, well I got it, and I did it, and it was an incredible experience. It was just amazing. Uh, but when it was over, you know, I thought it was great. It was wonderful. It was I had so much fun. It was fulfilling. It was invigorating and I worked my tail off without anybody having to push me mm-hmm. but you can't make a living at that you know so I went to school and I just, you know, started doing my sports med thing and uh, didn't do well in school initially because I had too much fun um, and then uh, uh, started to realize that part of the curriculum for sports medicine was these labs you had to take where you had to dissect human cadavers Ooh. and I, I couldn't do that yeah. So when my grades were bad and then I realized this program isn't really what I thought it was going to be, Mm. I really had to reevaluate. And I, you know, again, it was sort of like what I went through with the potential job change, just sort of busted it all down to the bare minimum. And what I came up with was this idea that I had an opportunity going to this great school to set myself up for the rest of my life. Mm. That's what the phrase kept running through my head. Mm. So what's the best way to do that? And what I decided was that I wanted to find that thing that I would do that wouldn't, didn't feel like work. I didn't want to get a job. I, w- I would have felt bad if I'd have gone through four years of college and ha- come out with a job. I wanted to find my passion. I wanted to find the thing that, yes, it was work, and hopefully I can make a living at it, but that, that I would do for free because I loved it. And the acting thing kept popping up because of the fact that I was so self-motivated. Mm-hmm. I loved it. I got feedback and praise and support like I'd never gotten before. Mm-hmm. I guess I had some talent because uh, from what I had no experience and I, it went pretty well. And so um, I figured, okay, that all's got to mean something. Mm-hmm. And uh, so after a whole lot of soul searching and talking to my family and talking to friends, and I gave up my scholarship and changed my major. And here we are. Yeah. So oh, I'm very great. grateful. Uh, to again to that for that experience and and all the people there supported me it was a great time my grades took off funny how when you find <laughs> when something you're really happy. interested in right? yeah, yeah. You, yeah my grades went I mean after the first quarter of my freshman year I was on what they call subject to dismissal because I had a 1.0 GPA wow. STD which means something totally different now. <laughs> um, by the end of the first quarter of my junior year I got straight A's I was on the dean's list wow good for so you. Yeah. I turned it around, and I was having great fun. And I remember the summer after my junior year, right before my senior year, I actually went back to school early because I was so excited about the shows they were doing, and I was going to get direct that year, and I was, I was just all pumped up. So Wonderful. I, I'm, I'm fortunate that you know I found my niche, and I, that's what I tell kids these days, that you've got to do what you love. You mm-hmm. just have to. And I, it doesn't have to be acting. It could be engineering. It could be law. It could be whatever. Right. I, I was fortunately able to turn it into a positive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, and I think that has, has followed me a lot through my career. I mean, my book that I wrote was about overcoming obstacles and how to how and to like take those moments it. and make them positive for yourself. And you don't have to take it when it comes at you. And that I've always tried to try to find the positive in every moment. You know, I have a friend who, and I, I wrote about her in the book. She's a showrunner. And um, we had a great conversation one day about how she views her work. And 
her thing is every day because showrunners deal with everything. Mm -hmm. You know the, the the convolution of the writers and the crew, and you know this all stuff. And there's always a crisis. Mm -hmm. Her thing was every day in her mind, we're going forward. Whatever we can do to go forward, even if it's a little bit. This day we're not going backward. Mm -hmm. We may we may go forward a lot. We may go forward a little bit. But my goal every day is to take this thing forward, and I think that's a great lesson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can apply that to any walk Anything, of life. anything. So when you did decide to go for acting mm -hmm. and you got into that degree program, what acting techniques did you learn? Well, we got a taste of a lot of stuff, which I thought was great. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, because again, I'm a sponge at this point because I'm, I'm thinking, man, I found my home. I want to, I want to take it all in. So you know, uh, tried a little, a little was a lot, mostly Stanislavski, uh, uh, a little bit of Stella Adler, a little bit of uh, Meisner, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But especially at that point, you know, you need to put it, put all the pieces on the table. You know, try everything. It's way too early to try to set something in stone. You know, because sure. you're just a sponge. You're young at that point. Right. You know, I, I was I was doing everything I could, and a lot. I, mean, I did children's theater. I did classical stuff. Did original stuff. Uh, big spaces, small spaces. They even did a play in dorms one time, you know, so it, it, wherever you could do stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a great experience. Some of the videos that I've seen that you've done over the years on YouTube, you talk about listening, you talk about mm -hmm. reacting emotionally, and that all sounds very Meisner to me. I'm trained in Meisner, so mm -hmm. that resonated with me. Okay. What tools were you given that enabled you to, to kind of, well, become a great actor? Well, thank you very much. I, I, I think I'm a work in progress, but thank you very much. I guess what, what it's evolved into, I'm not the same actor I was when I first started. I don't think anybody is, because mm -hmm. just like life, just like you as a human being, you evolve, mm -hmm. and you evolve with it. I've ended up taking much more of an, an eclectic approach. I don't claim to be a disciple of any one thing. Uh, I think that depending on the moment, depending on the context, depending on the material, it may require a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess, if anything, I'm probably more primarily something along more attuned to Stella Adler's idea, which is using your imagination um, and, and being present in this moment mm -hmm. and placing yourself here in this space right now with all of the particulars, all of the facts that led to this time, the other characters, you know, history of, your, of yourself and all of that, and, and just react in this moment. What is this moment here and just being right here? Um, and that seems to be most effective for me, and I think in... In television, which is where I work most of the time, because it's it's so tight and, and these days so high def mm -hmm. that they can't mm -hmm. see any technique. You know, it's right. got to look really spontaneous. It's got to look very natural. Yeah. Um, and so I spend more time doing that. And and I think what I learned back then a lot was a lot how to breaking down the script and preparation, and how important preparation is. Mm -hmm. And that um, you do you do all your homework beforehand, but then there has to be a point where you just say, okay, that's done. Now we're here, yeah. and just be present. A lot of actors, I think, make the mistake of, of keeping their preparation alive even in the moment, even after they say action. No, that's, that's you don't do that, because mm -hmm. then you're up here. Right. And as I used to tell people in acting class all the time, audiences don't pay money to watch actors think. Mm -hmm. They want to be moved. And you don't move them unless you really try to create that truth of the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and the truth of the moment is not up here. It's what's happening between you and the other actor, between you and the circumstances, even what's happening emotionally within you as you react to all of this stuff. But it's not about how I'm thinking about how I'm going to make this happen or what happened to so-and-so that happened 20 minutes ago. You've got to be here got to be fully present mm -hmm. and because that's what the camera loves the camera loves picking up the magic as it happens now right um, and so I think that that's the thing that of all the stuff that I learned then and where I am now that I really just try to focus on is making it happen here I'll never forget I don't know if I ever told you this story um, I I've consulted with Mike. Mike, you have a consulting mm -hmm. business for actors. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll get to that in a few minutes. But um, okay. I don't know if I ever told you the story during our consulting sessions about being focused and being in the moment. But mm -hmm. I, I used to take tap dance lessons in New York City Oh, cool! when I lived up north. I'm, cool. I'm from Rochester, New York. So I would drive to New York City every weekend. And I was on a swing dancing team there. And while I was there for swing dancing, I hooked up with this Broadway performer for tap lessons. 
And he was amazing. He was just like, I bow down to him even to this day. I haven't cool. seen him in years, but um, Ted Levy is his name. He's wonderful. Give him a plug. Yes, Ted Levy. Okay. And, <laughs> and anyway, so I would have my um, practice sessions with him, and we'd go to this old uh, studio in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that he used to do in order to drill into my head to be present in this moment and focus on what I was doing was he'd have me do a a little routine, and it was pretty simple, but it was, you know, a specific routine that I would do for a couple minutes. And he would dance around me in a circle and just stomp his feet, yell, scream, get in my face, you know, make funny faces at me, just sing whatever he could do to distract me. Yes. And he would do that (laughs) almost every time that Mm we practiced. And at first I was like, you cannot, I cannot concentrate, but he's like, that's the point. You have to concentrate on what you're doing and not on me. And, yeah. and over time, it really worked. Like, I got to the point where I could do my little ditty, and he was dancing he around was doing me, whatever, and, <laughs> and it and didn't, didn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you're on a film set and you're playing a, a, you know, a tight close-up or, or a, you know, an intimate scene with somebody, and there's a hundred crew around, there's cameras, there's lights, there's cables, there's all this kind of stuff, but, but you have to te- disconnect from that. Yes. Yeah. You you have to play the moment as if none of that is there. Yeah, it's a it, it's a it maybe not maybe is a moving distraction, but it's still distracting potentially if Absolutely. you allow it to be. Right, right. Um, and so yeah, I mean that's uh, that's why you do your homework. You make sure your intention is strong and clear, mm-hmm. and then you be just fully present. And you got to zero in on the other actor. Yes. Uh, and not let the other stuff get in the way. All right. Let's talk about your involvement with SAG. Okay, SAG after now. SAG after, yes, sorry. Yes. That's, that's correct. So, actually, that brings up another question I had for you since you mentioned SAG sure. after. <laughs> you did a PSA in 2012. I did. Advocating for the merger of SAG and AFTRA. I did. And you talked about how it would sort of stem the tide, is the phrase you used, stem the tide of non union work mm-hmm. here. So, now that the merger has taken place, do you see that that has come to fruition? Has that benefit been realized? Well, um, in this market, uh, I would say yes, uh, but n- probably not primarily because of the merger. The merger has helped. Mm-hmm. And I know in, in many areas, the merger has now allowed us to not compete as two unions for the same work, but, but put our organizing efforts together. Mm-hmm. We have a strong organizing initiative here now in the industrial area mm-hmm. where we're making some progress because a lot of that has gone non-union. We are getting more and more union commercials here. but. I would say that what's brought that on more than anything is the incentives. Oh, yeah. Because the incentives that we have here now have attracted 95% of the work is union, film, uh, television. But then also you have big commercials. Like this weekend, they're shooting a series of commercials with Jennifer Garner for Capital One. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a big enough commercial shoot that they're budget qualifies, meets the threshold to qualify for incentives. Right. So that's brought union that's work idea. here. Okay. So I think it's the, it's the co- always the cooperation between the two. I don't, I don't believe the union or the industry can necessarily do it all by themselves. There has to be that cooperation. We have been able, because of the merger, to get our organizing efforts combined mm-hmm. so that we're not organizing against each other. Mm-hmm. And we are making some headway in industrials. We're making some headway in voiceover. Uh, and yeah, we're, it, it, but it's tough. It, it's still a right to work state. Right. Um, and so it, it, it's always going to be a challenge. It's always been a challenge. But yeah, we're making progress. So explain for somebody like me or even someone who's just starting out in the business, I'm not union, mm-hmm. but I can still work on union projects. Yes. And I could at some point qualify for joining the union. So can you explain how that works? Well, um, b- because it's a right to work state, the, law, the state law and this wouldn't just be for our industry, it's any unionized workforce, says that you don't have to be a union member to to work on a union job. Mm -hmm. So that union work is open to you. You can audition for it, you can get it, you can do it. What that does allow you to do in your case, which is actually, and I have to admit, a benefit in that the union work is more accessible, Mm -hmm. so it allows people getting started to build a resume of higher caliber credits. It does. But the thing to always remember is that while yes it's a right to work state and you do have the ability to do that those contracts which are our most valuable asset the tv contract the commercials contract the film contract all the contracts that have these rates and protections that have been fought for for almost 70 years um, they're not guaranteed 
They're not guaranteed like death and taxes. Mm -hmm. They're only there because a collection of actors decided to stand on them right. and then join and become members to support them, to enforce them, and minister them and negotiate them. Right. And so at some point, if you're going to be a long-term career professional and you're going to keep working those contracts, you, you, you got to join. Mm -hmm. It's time to join. Uh, and especially if you want to compete in the larger markets, mm -hmm. New York or Los Angeles, which are what are called union security states. Mm -hmm. So you do have to be a union member there to get a union job. Right, right. What I always tell people coming from here is that you want to show up in Los Angeles or New York as a member, as opposed to go there to be and be eligible because they don't, that doesn't mean anything and it's not going to help you because right. they have thousands of members mm -hmm. that are in line way ahead of you. Um, so and plus the initiation fee is, is less here, so it's more affordable. Mm -hmm. And then you show up there as a member, you can really get in the mix and compete. Okay. So you were president for for how long? I I have been the local uh, president. I've been the national board member from here. I've served on several national committees. I, I started my union service probably in two thousand. Okay. Um, and uh, over time, I, I've had several positions. Uh, I've served on several national committees. I've been the co-chair of the National Negotiating Committee for the TV Theatrical Agreement the last three times. Um, and then currently now, I am the first vice president of this local. And then last year, I was elected a trustee of the Pension and Health Plan, mm. okay. which is a very prestigious appointment. It's a lifetime appointment. Mm. and. Um, they don't give it to just anybody, so I was very flattered. Nice. And it's uh, it's hard work, but it's good work because obviously pension and health care are really important to a lot of people. So yeah. I, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would. Good. Yeah. Great. And I know there's um, a very strong SAG presence here. Yeah, we have a terrific local. We have terrific staff. We have terrific leadership here. Mm -hmm. Our membership is growing. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is because there's a lot of union, more union work here. The membership's growing. Um, and yeah, our, our presence is good and strong, and we've had good success working with people in the industry here, um, and good relations with people. And I, I see no reason that that would change. It's yeah. been very positive. Good, great. Okay, I want to switch gears for a moment. Okay. And this is something that just is close to my heart for a number of reasons. Okay. Some having to do with acting, some not. But you have a, a YouTube video, paint, paint Me Blue. I do. And um, what does that mean, anyway? Paint me blue. What is that? <laughs> uh, what is uh, it was. Uh, uh, I, I've done a couple of presentations for uh, this uh, uh, business networking group uh, here in Georgia, mm -hmm. and you forgive me right now, and I cannot remember their <laughs> name. But um, they asked me to do something on uh, getting employee buy-in, mm -hmm. okay? okay, on a project or initiative or change and that kind of stuff. At the time they did that, uh, Avatar was really hot, mm -hmm. and, oh, I I, and so my my angle was that you know I'm going to use the metaphor of Avatar, which had you know close to 1,700 people in the credits all over the world, working on one man's vision to get this thing all done, and then, and then created the highest grossing film at the time mm -hmm. ever made, mm -hmm. and a movie that that at that that never could have been made before that because of the technological advancements that were required to do it. And so it was a monumental effort to create something that had never been done before, which required the buy-in mm -hmm. of all of these people from all over the world. So how do you get that? Got it. And so, uh, and I just used Paint Me Blue because all the blue characters in Avatar. Right, right. So during this talk, mm -hmm. you touched on treating, how to treat other people on your production, mm -hmm. and um, people don't want to be dictated to, they want to be a part of the process. Mm -hmm. So, and you had an experience about that, can you talk about? Uh, I've, had, I've had several experiences like that, and you know, this is a very cooperative art form. Mm -hmm. They're, and the, the, the good directors, the smart producers, the, their ideas usually are to do the best they can to create an environment where basically what you do is you give everybody, not just the actors, but everybody on the day, the tools and the space and the equipment to basically turn them loose and do what they do really well yeah. in, within the boundaries of what you need to get done. But you give them the freedom to give what they have. And those are, those are the times when it always works best. And I mean everybody. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen uh, day players show up. You know, it's one of the hardest things to do in this business to be a day player. Because everybody knows everybody. You're in there for one day. Yeah. You know, kind of and you got to be brilliant. You got to be just as brilliant as everybody else, right. but you're in and out, yeah. and nobody knows you, and you don't know them, and it's really awkward and uncomfortable. <laughs> but you know, the good ones will do what they can. They know that, 
so you know they, they they do what they can to make you feel comfortable make you feel at ease put you in the right place i mean i'm even had you know mark Harmon was one of my favorite people to work with not just because he went to ucla but when when i first showed up to work it, one of the first things he said to me he walked over and he said look uh, if you got any ideas anything you want to try do it i'll back you up great just say it hmm. and i thought wow I never met you before, and that's pretty cool. That's one of those instances where, hey, bring what you have. Right. You know, uh, like my daughter and a lot of other young actors, I tell them, you know, one of the things you got to do as an actor is don't show up prepared to just be kind of puppeted around. You know, show up with enthusiasm, and, and, and if you have a moment to throw in some ideas, throw in some ideas. I mean, you know, we all kind of judge the hierarchy and within reason and all, but be a contributor. Right. Don't just right. be somebody who's got to be kind of walked around and just so desperately afraid to screw up that they don't do anything. You know, you want to show up and, and participate. So what I was trying to say there to people is you want to create that kind of environment, you know. I've worked with, I mean, I'm working with a guy like Robert Altman that I got to work with for a couple of days on the Gingerbread Man. I mean, he's all about that because he even goes to the point of kind of throwing the script away. Mm. You know, here, here's what the scene's about, and, and here's what I need to get, and, and, and here's where we need to be at the end of the scene. Mm -hmm. Go. You know, what do you got? What can you do? Right. And it's, it's freeing. It's wonderful. And, and you know, you, you, so you make your choices. Of course, we did this in the audition, and then when you get cast, you show up on the set, and he's, you're there because he liked your ability to do that then. Mm -hmm. and, and it was great. It was kind of thrilling. It was scary. Every take was different, but he wanted that, right. and it was all spontaneous, and it was great. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's been, again, and, and the good ones really do that. I mean, I, I had an instance on the, on the Good Wife recently where, you know, showed up to do the scene, and uh, we rehearsed it, and it was fine. And then uh, we get up to do it again. I, I, I had an idea. You know, the director, I said, I, I, can I try something? I did it. I liked it. We did it, you know. Mm -hmm. you, they're, they're, the smart ones are welcoming to that. So, you, so we, as actors or employees or team members or whoever we are, we also have to not be fearful of, of participating and throwing things in within reason. I mean, a lot of people, what they eventually, no, I won't say a lot of people, but some people will do it as a way to control or dominate. And that's uh, not the point. Yeah, no, you, you want to contribute to the story. You want to contribute. Because the point is, is that, and I said this in the video, is that the leadership and management is, is all about enabling people for the greater good. Mm -hmm. In other words, when we all win, we all win. So let's all win. You know, you get yours, you get yours, you get yours, I get mine, everybody wins. Mm. And that's that's the kind of environment that gets created, and, and I've been fortunate to work with a lot of those people. Hmm. Have you ever been in the opposite kind of environment? Sure. So what do you do? You oh, yeah. do what they say? You adapt. And, and just, you, you adapt. Yeah. You be polite, you be be professional, you be respectful, you know, and, and you just you do it. And and what I also try to do is understand that, that my vision is different from the director's vision over there. Mm -hmm. I, I have to acknowledge that because he or she is thinking of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. He or she is thinking of how this is going to fit into the other pieces I've shot. And so I, I got to give them the benefit of the doubt that they know more about that than me. So if they finally say, no, I got to have this. Okay, great. I'll do it for you. You know, and, and that's fine. Uh, you, again, you just got to adapt. Yeah. As long as, again, as long as it's true, you know, there are some moments, it's, it's very rare, but there are some moments where they may make you do something or, or push you to do something, and, and hopefully you've done your homework and you know the character well enough and you just say, but, but based on, you remember that scene we did earlier? Mm -hmm. And if I go ahead and do this now, then one of those is a lie. So that's not going to help you or me. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'll do it your way if you really need that, fine. But, but. If we did that, and now you want me to do this, it's not going to match up. It's not going to make sense, you know. And yeah. then, you, then you, you you go along with whatever the person in leadership eventually says. And you have to have a certain amount of of self assurance, like not cockiness, but you need to be confident that your choices mm -hmm. and your training is all behind you, supporting what you want to do or what you're suggesting. Yes. So you cannot, like you said, you can't really be afraid of getting on there and contributing to the story. Yeah. So. Yeah. You, you have to be there. To, first of all, when you get cast and you're there, you're there because they want you there. Mm 
mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. And, and they don't want you to just wear the wardrobe and hit the mark. They want you to be alive yeah. in the moment. You know, feel your part. They want a human being, yes. not a robot. So, so bring something. <laughs> yeah. Bring some ideas. Bring energy. Bring fun. Bring passion. Bring what you got. And, and you know, if you come up with something clever in the moment or you come up with an idea, you can say, great, hey, how about this? And they'll say, great. Or you'll, you'll say, how about this? And they'll say, oh, God, no. Okay, fine. Whatever. <laughs> Moving on. God, you know, so. that's okay. Fine. <laughs> okay. That, I have so many actors ask that question about how you know the difference, you know, what's right and wrong. And, and, and that's not a fair question. It's not really about right or wrong. It's about trying to make the best choices to find the truth of the moment. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you've got to go through some wrong to get to the right. So, you, so especially in our process, hopefully before you get to the set, you, you try some of those choices out before you find that moment of truth where it kind of zeroes in there where the pieces fit and you're not having to go through a lot of wrong stuff to finally find the right stuff in the right. moment yeah. but you can't be afraid of the process and you can't be afraid of participating fully and completely um, to make the thing work mm-hmm.